Well, good morning. God is good. And all the time. It is always great to hear so many friendly voices out there. And, um, you know, it just shows the, the love that we have for one another and the, the excitement that we have for one another. So it's always great to hear your voices as, as we gather. And um, hope no matter whether this is your first time or you've been here for many years, that you find a, a warm welcome when you come in, not just a warm welcome by other people, but hopefully you experience the welcome of the Lord Jesus who welcomes us all here um, by his amazing grace and just wants to shower us with his, um, his love and, and the power of his Holy Spirit today. So if you are new, my name is Pastor Dave, and uh, our church mission statement here is knowing Christ and making Christ known. And we believe that Jesus it truly is the hope of the world. He's the hope for all people. He's the hope of every heart that feels um, unfulfilled and unsatisfied. He wants to completely fill us with his love, his purposes, and uh, his plans for our lives. And so it's great to welcome you here in his name this morning. Let's enter into worship knowing we are loved by God. Let's bow before him. Father, you are so good to each and every one of us. And I pray that, Lord, as we meet here in this place, as we sing to you, as we worship, as we pray, as we hear your word, first and foremost, I pray that you would be honored and glorified because worship is all about you. And, and giving you the thanks and the praise and the reverence that you are due. But Lord, we know that as we worship you and we encounter the power of your Holy Spirit, that you transform us into people that you can use for your glory. And so we pray that as we engage in worship with you, that heaven and earth would come together, that we would be transformed by your love and your power and your grace, and that we would be um, that we would be drawn to you in such a way that we would leave the ways of sin behind, that we would pursue holiness, that we would want to be transformed, and we would want to be sent out into our world to proclaim the name of Jesus with our words and with our lives. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask for you to come and fulfill your purposes here among us. Draw us all closer to you and closer to one another. We pray this in the mighty, saving name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to read uh, part of chapter 2 in the book of Revelation. And this uh, section is titled, To the Church in Pergamum. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me. Not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore. I, I'm, I'm assuming David will explain to us who the Nicolaitans are or were. Um, Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Now there's a mystery. May God bless the reading of, our, of, the, of his word and our understanding of it. What a blessing to be able to turn to God's word each and every day, each and every uh, week in, in uh, worship, 
Um, I don't know how people do it when they have to live this life and experience pain and struggle and confusion and conflict and all of these things without a guiding focus for their lives. And so whenever we are struggling or when we're experiencing joy, we can look to the Word of God to give us the peace and the focus and the direction that we need. Uh, As we dive into God's Word this morning, we are in week three in this series called Revive, and that's actually taken from the front cover of a book by Ed Love, who wrote a book all about the um, churches in Revelation. And so our series is loosely based on this book. Um, What we're doing is we're using that as kind of like a jumping off point, but then um, diving into Revelation itself to really see what God would have for us. And we're Our series is called Revive because 2,000 years after these words were written through John, we as a church need focus. We need to be revived. It's so easy to get tired and distracted and disappointed and confused and off track, but we need the, the guiding focus of God's word, the words of Jesus to come to us to wake us up to revive us, to get us back on track, because as human beings, we are prone to drift. Just as that famous hymn says it, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. But here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. That's what we want is our hearts sealed, our hearts focused, our hearts committed and engaged, engaged. yet so often we drift. And so these letters that Jesus wrote through John to the churches in Revelation. We need the same word, the same encouragement, the same correction, the same rebuke, so that we don't drift and wander and forsake our first love, but we're focused and committed and passionate to live for Jesus in a way that would bring glory to him and in a way that would shine light to those around us so that they they too can put their focus on Christ. So this is the third letter of seven that we'll be looking at. The first letter was a letter to Ephesus. Do you remember their their issue? They had forsaken the love they had at first. Uh, Remember me skipping across the campus to Heather and then, you know, needing to rekindle that? Um, That happens in our walk of faith as well. And so Jesus was saying, you have forsaken the love you had at first. You need to do the things you did at first. Show that love, show that passion, show that commitment repent and do the things you did at first. And then last week we looked at Smyrna and it was all about staying faithful in the midst of persecution. And today we are looking at um, the church in Pergamum. And Aaron, I think I have a picture if you just want to put that up for a few moments. Um, These are all on the western side of Turkey. And so these are not imaginary fairy tale places. These are all on the western side of Turkey and they're along the Aegean Sea just above the Mediterranean. And so um, Pergamum is the next one up, Ephesus, and then Smyrna, and now we're looking at Pergamum. And this was a a famous, great city in the ancient world, and uh, we're going to get to that in a moment. But you can see that there is actually the remains of um, Pergamum and temples. It was built on a hill a thousand feet up in elevation, and it was not right on the coast, but it was about 15 miles from the Aegean Sea. And that's one reason why Ephesus and Smyrna became um, probably more important, but this we'll hear in a few moments about how this was such a central place in um, Roman culture, both because of its importance religiously and politically and in several other, um, in several other ways as well, and we'll get to that. But, um, so you can, you can take that off, Aaron. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open or introduce this um, main theme with this story. When my little niece Jessica was about maybe four years old, she asked my sister Amy, her mother, a very important question. Mom, who do you love more, me or Jesus? My sister had to just pause for a moment, and she said, well, Jessica, I love you both. And Jessica was indignant. She persisted. No, Mom, who do you love more, me or Jesus? Just answer. And uh, my sister, you know, was trying to give an answer that would satisfy little Jessica. And, um, well, Jessica, I'm supposed to love you both. No, just answer. And finally, my sister, I think she was inspired by the Holy Spirit because she said this. I lo- she says, Jessica, she, when I love Jesus more, I'm able to love you more. When I love Jesus more, I'm able to love you more. Our, our passage, our focus this morning is all about allegiances, just as Amanda shared with the children. And our highest, our first, our central allegiance is to be for Jesus. 
And yet, when we seek to live lives with our primary allegiance being to Jesus, it puts every other potential allegiance that would vie for our hearts and vie for our lives, it puts those in tension and brings conflict. Whether it's a little girl saying, Mom, who do you love more, me or Jesus? And my sister has to answer, well, if I love Jesus the most, that will help me love you more. But to a four-year-old, if it's not, well, you need to love me more. That, that brings tension. And all kinds of tensions arise when Jesus wants to be the central place of importance in our hearts, and yet there are so many other things that will vie for the throne of our hearts, or that will vie for the throne of our church, or that will vie for the throne of even our country. And so this morning we're looking at this whole topic of allegiances and about making Christ Lord of all. It's not just children who have trouble understanding this. Even adults in our culture uh, really get confused and, and get all bent out of, out of whack when it comes to Christians living for Christ above all else. Being a true follower of Christ in Pergamum, just as living for Christ today, it was a risky adventure because there was so much pressure to conform to culture. And so you saw the picture of Pergamum a few moments ago. It was the greatest city in Asia. By the time John wrote this letter, it had been a capital city for 400 years. So think about the importance of Washington, D.C., and now think about Pergamum as a place of political power, an, an administrative capital, a religious capital. And not only was it an important center of power like D.C., but the, its geographical um, position made it even more impressive, being built a thousand feet high so anybody walking around it could look up and say, there's Pergamum, that place of power, that place of um, worship and idols, that place of, um, that, that central place in our culture. So it was the center of culture. It had a library that rivaled the Library of Alexandria in Greece with 200,000 parchment scrolls. So it was, a, it was a center of knowledge, it was a center of culture, it was a center of learning. And it was also one of the great religious centers in ancient world where the people in Pergamum really thought of themselves as defenders of Greek culture and the Greek way of, of worshiping all these gods. So after a great victory in battle, a huge altar to Zeus was built. And even on top of that 1,000 foot high city, there was a 40 foot high altar that was dedicated to Zeus. And it looked like a great seat. And around that area is where animal sacrifices of all kinds were, were, um, were, were made, and the smoke would constantly be rising around that big um, temple, that big altar to Zeus. And so the people had all of this that they were taking in. They saw this city a thousand feet high, then they saw this altar to Zeus that looked like a big seat or a big throne, and then they saw all this smoke rising up from the sacrifices that were being made to Zeus and to other gods in that ancient city. And so what happened was these animals would be sacrificed. The meat that was a part of those sacrifices would then be taken down into the market and sold at the stores, which now you can see why it was so hard for Christians who were told, do not, meet, do not eat the meat sacrificed to idols. To try to live a life holy unto God was difficult because just going into the marketplace where, these, where this meat was there for purchase that it was a part of the sacrifices that were made to Zeus and all these other gods, and yet, Jesus, yet God is saying, worship me and not me alone. And so just being a part of the culture made it difficult to live with a single focus on Jesus because all of these other cultural currents were coming against them. And so Jesus, through John, refers to Pergamum as the place of Satan's throne because of things like the altar and the temple to Zeus. Not only that, but this was like the center of um, the god of medicine, Asclepius. And so there was actually the snake uh, was a symbol of ancient medicine. And so a lot of the hospitals had the, this god Asclepius a attached to it. So even going to try to save your life or the life of a family member and going to a hospital meant you had to walk by these gods, the god of Asclepius. You see the god of Zeus. You see all these gods that were revered in ancient Pergamum and it made it very difficult to live for Christ and Christ alone. So this Asclepius it was attached to the title Soter, Asclepios Soter, which means Asclepios, the Savior. Imagine a Christian trying to go around and, and, and live in a culture where everyone's talking about Asclepios the Soter, Asclepios the Savior, and you say, wait a minute, 
Jesus is my only Savior. I can't give the name Soter, Savior, to any other God when Jesus is my God, and he is my God alone. Idolatry hasn't stopped 2,000 years later just because we've stopped making our idols out of wood and precious metals and stone. We don't have the same visible idols today where we, where we erect some sort of statue or an altar, but we have gods that kind of resemble the same thing. We have gods of materialism. We, we tend to attach ourselves to the gods of political power. We tend to asta- attach our lives to the gods of sexual pleasure. Materialism, power, fame, popularity, influence, all of these things can be gods that vie for the throne of our hearts. And so we, like the ancient Christians, have to deal with a problem. This is your big 50-cent word. You can impress your mom. Syncretism, where it's a mixing, it's a blending, it's an accommodation where all the gods are, are supposed to be worshipped. See, in, ancient, in the ancient world, they didn't care if you worshipped Jesus. What they cared about is if you said, I worship Jesus, so I can't worship Asclepius. I worship Jesus, so I can't worship Zeus. I worship Jesus, so I can't worship Caesar. Jesus is my Lord, so I can't say Caesar is Lord. And that's what raised the temperature in the atmosphere. You can say Jesus is Lord as long as you still say Caesar is Lord. But as soon as you stop saying Caesar is Lord, you're saying Jesus is Lord, now we have a problem. That's that whole word or that that whole um, environment of syncretism is, oh, we accept everybody's gods. Everybody's gods are welcomed. Unless you say that your God is the God above all gods and that because of your focus and your reverence of your God, you cannot worship the gods of the culture around you. This is one of the main reasons that Christians in the Roman Empire faced persecution because people of Rome had to declare Caesar is Lord. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you can't say Caesar is Lord because only Jesus is Lord. And so the Roman Empire just could not understand this about Christians. Why are they so, um, why are they so narrow? Why are they so exclusive? Why can't they just say Caesar is Lord and go on with it? You see, the people of Rome, they, they were looking for a unifying principle to bring society together. And this sounds a lot like our culture. But they were looking for some sort of stream or some sort of current, some sort of object to, to rally their culture around so that that could be the unifying principle of their society. And so they looked to Caesar as that unifying principle, as that unifying force, because Caesar was worshipped and he was given, he was given um, the credit for their protection and for their, uh, their provision, for their prosperity and all of these things. Caesar, as they said Caesar is Lord and Roman society is moving forward, people gave credit to Caesar. And so in Rome, they wanted the people to worship Caesar and revere him as Lord. I'm sure in that day, the Roman authorities probably looked at Christians and said, why do you Christians hate Caesar? And the Christians were probably like, we don't hate Caesar. We just can't say Caesar is Lord because Jesus is Lord. As believers in Christ, we know that we cannot go around and just say Jesus is Lord, but this is also my Lord, and this is my Lord, but Jesus is Lord, but this is my Lord too. If you're a follower of Christ, Jesus cannot merely be one of many gods but your one and only God. In our lives, this is something that I heard as a teenager and it's always stayed with me. Jesus is either Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. We want Jesus, but we want Jesus in everything else. And Jesus says, I want your full reverence. I want your full devotion. I want you to worship me as Lord and, and I, I give you so many other blessings. I want to bless you. I want to lead you. I want to give you peace and joy and all of that. But you cannot cling to your other gods with one hand and come and try to cling to me with the other. You have to let go of all other gods so you can grab hold of me and I can grab hold of you. The rationale in the Roman Empire for persecution went something like this. We've established Caesar as a unifying principle for our society, and you better not speak out or act against him. You can practice your Christianity, Christians, 
but you better not defy any of our cultural norms and celebrations that we look to as a unifying symbol for our lives, as a unifying principle of our lives. If you do not worship Caesar as we tell you, you will be shut down and your life will be extinguished. There's something that the Roman citizens had to do to show this, and it reminds me of things that are going on in our day. Every Roman citizen, because Caesar was looked to as this unifying principle, they had to go and they had to um, go to the temple of the emperor and they had to take a pinch of incense and they had to burn it as a reverential act of worship to Caesar. And they had to say, Caesar is Lord. And when the Roman citizens did that, they would be given a written certificate. This is a compliant citizen, a faithful, loyal citizen of Rome. They can go on and gain admittance to cultural places. They can go on and live because they are good citizens of Rome. They revere Caesar as Lord. And so with this certificate that they're faithful citizens of Caesar and Rome, they could go on with their lives without persecution, gain admittance, go through culture much more easily than a Christian that says, wait a minute, you want me to do what? Take a pinch of incense and burn it unto Caesar so that I can have access to different places in society? I don't think so. My faith in the Lord Jesus will not allow me to burn incense to Caesar and say that he is Lord. I cannot do that. Do you you feel the tension? So the Christians are like, we can't just worship him and compromise our faith as we're called to love, honor, and revere Jesus as the Lord of our lives. We can't just say Jesus is Lord and Caesar is Lord and go on and and think that we're going to be okay before our God doing that. But the Roman government was incapable of understanding this posture, this conviction of the Christians. And so Christians who would not burn incense to Caesar were viewed as disloyal and they had to be outlawed. And so every Christian in Pergamum was under the permanent, constant threat of death because they were not living as loyal citizens unto Caesar. And I'm sure the society was like, why can't you just worship Caesar like the rest of us. It seems that in 21st century North America, we have a lot of the Roman Empire mindset still at work in our culture. And I don't mean to create another level of tension, but we saw this played out in the National Hockey League this week. This week, the Philadelphia Flyers had a pride night on Tuesday night before um, one of their hockey games. And so before the game, every player was expected to put on a rainbow-colored jersey and go out and skate around the ice during, pre-game, during the pregame warm-up. And there was one Russian hockey player, he's Russian Orthodox, um, Ivan Preverov, and he, he didn't make a stink about it, he just stayed in the locker room and didn't want to be a part of that. And you can imagine the firestorm that erupted after that. And uh, before, I think before that pregame skate was even over, the media was going crazy. Where's Ivan Provorov? Why isn't he out there skating around with his team? What in the world is wrong with him? And the media jumped all over him. And after the game, Provorov told the media, he said this, I respect everybody, and I respect everybody's choices. My choice is to stay true to myself and my religion, and that's all I'm going to say. I think he could have done a little better. I think he could have said more to kind of uh, you know, but it's tough when, you, when you're just caught off guard and you have all this media swarming around you with wanting answers. And so I think he should have said more like, my faith leads me to love all people and treat everyone as teammates. I want anyone who is interested in the game of hockey, fans and players, to feel welcomed into a friendly environment where there's no bullying or ridicule, where we respect each other. He could have said something like that. He could have, I admit, he could have gone farther. Um, I don't know if that would have helped or mattered because you should have heard what was said about Ivan Preverov after the game. A day or two after the game, some hockey analysts were still fired up that one, EJ Raddick on NHL Network said this, if this is that much, and he says it with a lot of anger, so I'm trying not to like overdo it. If anything, he sounded angrier than I'll, I'll try to portray in this. He says, if this is that much of a problem for him to assimilate into his group of teammates and in the community and here in this country, that's okay. Listen, you can feel any way you want, but the beauty of it is, if it bothers you that much, there's always a chance to leave. Go back to where you feel more comfortable. I understand there's a conflict of sorts going on over there. Maybe get involved in that. Did you hear that sentiment? If you're not going to assimilate around the unifying principle we've set for society, go back to where you came from, maybe get involved in that war, 
and maybe die in that war. That's, that's the sentiment that was expressed for Ivan Preverov. Why we can't, as a society, come and say, let's learn from each other. Why do you want to wear the Roman, or why do you want to wear the rainbow colors, or why don't you? Let's talk about it and learn from each other. But instead, there's such this, there's a hasty desire to demonize one another. And I think for so long, Christians were the ones viewed as self-righteous and legalistic, and the pendulum was over here. And now, um, Christians, if they uh, speak up for convictions, then they're viewed as hateful. And, and what we need to do is come together as a society and say, we love and welcome all people. Let's learn from each other rather than being so quick to demonize. In ancient Rome, I don't think there was much of an interest in saying, why can't you say Caesar is Lord? Let us learn from you. Let's live together as, as peaceful citizens. And the Christians could have, sa- could have shared and the, the Romans could have shared and they could have come to more understanding without so much demonization. As followers of Christ, I want us to lead the way, not in drawing lines of division where we say we're right, you're wrong, we're good, you're bad, but where we come together and truly love each other to say, let's have conversations that are difficult. Let's learn from each other. Let's move this society forward. But now in our society, we we just swing from one extreme to the other where there's not room for nuance. There's not room for conversation. There's not room for engagement. There's not room to love people who think differently than you. It's just complete demonization and judgment. And I hope that as the church of Jesus Christ, we can lead the way in that. Quite frankly, one of the ways that I think the church is getting it wrong is in the the realm of politics. And that's not taking sides. I think that so easy, one of, the, one of the things that's so easy to do is to grab hold of, of the God of political power and, so, and to so much grab hold of that God on either side that we don't say, where would Jesus lead us forward and bring unity to this discussion? Where can we come together and, and talk about our differences in such a way that we show love and respect and we move forward rather than just demonizing each other and, and, and shutting each other down? We have a long way to go as a church, and we have a long way to go as a society. I don't mean just our church individually. I mean as a church, um, a, a, as a church of Jesus Christ globally. We, we have a, I believe we have a responsibility in this culture to lead the way in loving people beyond lines of disagreement and division. Because one thing we do not see in society is a growing love and tolerance for all people. We, we, we see diversity talked about, but we don't see respect for the diversity of ideas. We don't see respect for the diversity of different political viewpoints. We see people pointing fingers and saying, you're insane, or you're hateful, or you're bigoted, or you hate this group. You like, oh, you're supporting this group? That means you must hate this group. And it's like, no. Speaking up for one group doesn't mean we hate another group. But in our society, we have so much work to do. I get so concerned over talks about civil war and and things like that in our own country. And I think, church, we have to lead the way. Because if we just grab hold to our own political powers and say this is what's going to lead us forward to draw a line in the sand and say we're right and you're evil, our society is in real trouble. But as believers in Christ, we say let's show the world how to come together and talk and pray for each other and love each other and respect each other and then we can have conversations that move us forward. As we look to, that was all the introduction. No, I mean, now we're, let, let's focus. Now that I've got us into some, uh, some things to think about, let's focus on the words of Jesus in Ro- Revelation 2, 12 to 17. Because now we've, we've set up the scenario, and now let's look to what Jesus says. He says to the angel, remember that doesn't necessarily just mean a spiritual being, that could mean messenger. So to the messenger of the church of Pergamum, write these words, John, share these words with people I love so that they can be revived, so that they can live a, a life together that is pleasing to me. And so he says, these are the words of him who has a sharp double-edged sword. In that time period, the proconsul had a double-edged sword that meant authority. And now Jesus is saying, I'm going to proclaim my word, I am the authority. And so it says in verse 12, these are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. Verse 13, I know where you live, Pergamum. I know your idols. I know the altars. I know the temples. I know the struggle. I know the conflict where Satan has his throne. Isn't that interesting that he says where Satan has his throne? Satan wasn't willing to bow down and revere Jesus as Lord, and that was tough for the people in Roman culture 2,000 years ago. 
And Jesus says this through John. He says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, where it's so difficult to live for me, essentially. He says, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Jesus is saying, the bishop of Pergamum, Antipas, he's already been martyred before you, and yet you remain true to my name. I commend you for that. I celebrate you for that. The Roman governor was the one who had basically like a thumbs up, thumbs down in gladiator. He had complete authority to say whether somebody would live or die by the sword. And the believers knew all it takes is one Roman governor to say death, and that's the end. And yet so many believers were remaining true, and Jesus says that to them. You remain true to my name. We follow the one who was mocked, tortured, insulted, crucified on a cross because of his mission for God the Father. He was crucified by the Romans, and yet he, as he is killed by Romans, the Roman society, he was actually laying down his life in sacrificial love. And what did he do as he's dying for the sins of humanity? He prayed for his executioners. Father, forgive them, for they don't even know what they're doing. When we are being attacked, when we are being misunderstood, when we are being mistreated, what did the Lord our God do? He prayed words of grace and love over the people who were killing him. And we're called to follow him and love sacrificially, even when it's hard, even when people don't love us, even when people don't understand us. Yet there were some believers in Pergamum who were not willing to say, I follow Jesus and Jesus alone, so bring on Caesar, I'll follow him, bring on these other gods, I'll follow them. And so Jesus has more to say, and he goes on in verse 14, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Just like back in the Old Testament, and you can look this up in Numbers 22 to 24, there are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. So Jesus is saying, here's the problem. You want me, but you want all these other gods. Can I just say that we are all, all of us, as Calvin, John Calvin said, we all have hearts that are many idol factories. And when we say we have a problem with idols, we're not pointing our finger at any group or any individual. We all have idols. Whether we are old, young, married, single, have kids, don't have kids, have a job, don't have a job, idols of materialism, idols of sexual immorality, idols of power, idols of, um, uh, of revenge, all kinds of idols can attach to our hearts. And Jesus is calling us to give those up. Jesus tells them what was necessary in verse 15, and he tells this to us. Remember, I'm not, I'm not sharing this scripture as well. We all know we're the ones who are faithful, and then there are probably some others out somewhere who are unfaithful. God's word speaks to the good and evil, and that doesn't mean the good people and the evil people. That means all people that have both good and evil within their heart. I know I need the idols in my heart challenged every single day. And every Wednesday when I talk to my accountability group at 6 in the morning and we Zoom and I'm sitting there on my living room sofa with my coffee with one eye open and I'm talking to my three, guy, three pastor friends and we say, okay, what secrets do you have? What sins have you committed? What do you need to confess this morning? I have to talk about the idols that want to try to cling to my heart and how I have to renounce them and by the grace of Jesus gain power over them so that I can leave them behind and not say, yeah, guys, I want Jesus and these other idols. It's how can we share our sins, share our struggles, share these um, temptations in such a way that through our power of confession and receiving the grace of God together, we leave the idols behind so that we can cling to Christ and Christ alone. Jesus tells them what's required in verse 15. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. And as Keith said, I wish I could do more, but I'll just say they were ones who were um, trying to engage in cultural compromise to look at Jesus, but also look to the gods of materialism and power and, and, and pleasure and all the rest. And so in verse 16, Jesus says, repent therefore. You know, that's such a churchy word, but it simply just means change your mind, change your heart, change your direction, and walk in the way that leads to life through the grace of Christ. Repent therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And I think what that means is God is saying, my word is going to be the final say, and I will speak my power, I will speak my correction, I will speak my truth into your life and into the lives of those who would um, be resistant. And, and my word has authority. 
Let's remember here that every single change that Jesus wants us to make in our lives is for our good. Do you believe that at the core of your being? Everything that Jesus calls us to do through his word is for our good. And then he says this, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, that word Nike, Nike, victory, to the one who is victorious, who perseveres and is faithful to the end, listen to these promises, I will give some of the hidden manna. God provides through his hidden manna, the hidden manna of his word that that feeds us. But I think the hidden manna is just the, the power and the strength that comes from his grace each day. So he's saying, I will give you companionship. I will give you the indwelling presence of my spirit. I will give you my grace, my truth to sustain you and feed you. Jesus says, I will give you the hidden manna, my provision, my grace, my, my strength, my provision, my, my sustenance. And then he also says this, and we'll, we'll start to wrap up with this. I will also give that person, this is what I hope all of us want to receive. He says, I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Remember how they had to compromise and they had to go and pinch that incense to Caesar and worship Caesar and say Caesar is Lord and they would get that written certificate that would give them access into the theater and into the stadium and into the cultural places of that day? Jesus is saying, you guys couldn't do that. You didn't have that access. You weren't accepted in society. You were not tolerated. You were not admitted. You were not accepted. You were not welcomed. A white marble stone was used to get into the stadium. A white marble stone was used to get into the theater. A white marble stone was used to gain admittance into different cultural locations in that society. And Jesus says, I will give that person a white stone with a new name on it, known only to those who receive it. Also, stones were used in the court. Black, guilty, white, acquitted. It could mean something to do with that as well. But white marble tokens were used for admittance into special events in the Roman society. And Jesus says to them, if you persevere to the end, even though you've been shut out of society, even though you are under the constant, perse- the, the constant threat of death, your name will be engraved as an invitation to come into my kingdom. And so be faithful to the end because you will, at your last day, have that white marble stone that I have given you with your name on it, and that will give you entrance into my eternal kingdom. And so you may suffer ridicule as a Christian. You may be lonely. You may, you, you may feel like a follower of Jesus who's misunderstood, who's, who's persecuted, who's ridiculed. But Jesus would say to us, as he says in Joshua, choose this day whom you will serve. And so as we close, is Jesus your one of many, or is Jesus your one and only? You know, I I wish I could say that after 47 years of following Christ, if you count like the time as a baby where I I didn't really object to Christ at that time, didn't really make a profession of faith that young. I wish I could say that through all these decades of following Christ and all this time as being a pastor that I I could say, you know, it's so easy to just make Jesus your one and only God. But it's hard every day. I mean, your God might be Oreos, your God might be anger, your God might be revenge, your God might be a focus on money and an unhealthy worry about finances and all of these little gods attached to our hearts saying, focus on me and I will give you, I will give your heart contentment. I'll give you peace. And the Lord is trying to get through all of these gods that vie for our hearts, the materialism, the the fame, the popularity, the pleasure, all of these things. And Jesus is trying to say, I want you to, I want you to worship me and me alone. And then everything else will, will fall into place. You know, my heart goes out to teens and young people who have all these cultural currents. I remember when I was a kid, and like I felt this pressure too. I'd show up at a hockey game, and uh, like my friend Todd would look over, hey Dave, still don't believe in sex before marriage? No, you're crazy. You know, and like, like I'm, not a t- I'm not saying Jesus and, I'm saying Jesus only, but that's hard in our culture. And, and it's, it, we swim against a culture that would say, you can be a Christian, you just better you know, attach yourself to all these other gods or or, or you're not going to be going in the right direction. And we have to stay true to Jesus' word and say, Lord, it's you and you alone. Help me to be faithful, knowing that that one day I will receive not only the manna from heaven, the secret manna, the hidden manna, but I will receive that white marble. I will receive acceptance into your eternal kingdom. And so that's what we live for. 
And as we, as we live in that way, we live with grace, we live with love, we live with a willingness to respect all people, even those who don't share our beliefs, and we hope to point them to the Jesus who loves all, who embraces all, who wants us to walk with, um, with people to point them to the Christ who loves them and died for them. I know I'm challenging myself as I say this one more time. Is Jesus your one and only, or is Jesus your one of many? May he be our one and only. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love in our lives. And I have to confess that day after day, I am an unfaithful person and I, I get distracted and I, my heart can wander. Jesus, I pray that you would draw each one of us back to you today. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us for the idols we have put up in our hearts. And Jesus, help us to follow your lead, to love you and to love others in a way that would please you and bring glory to your holy name. Lord, we don't want to be viewed as those who are against people. We don't want to be viewed as those who um, are against society. Jesus, we want to follow you. You came and you died for the world. So help us to follow your, in your footsteps and live lives of sacrificial love for those around us. Jesus, I pray for anyone here who feels especially in chains because of an idol. And Lord, I speak freedom in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would come and bring clarity, bring focus, that we might worship you above all else, that we might bring glory to your holy name, and that we might live with the joy of knowing that you will one day welcome us into your kingdom. We love you, Lord. We give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we go out into the world that is so much like the Roman Empire of 2,000 years ago, let's live with a focus on Jesus, seeking to share his love, a love that's not um, brought down or distracted by division or by different things in our society that would divide us. But let's be like Jesus, who goes out into our world, who loves the woman at the well, who loves Zacchaeus, the tax collector, who loves those fishermen who were ordinary, everyday people. And yet he went and he pointed people to the Father through his love and through his grace that led the way. There are so many things that can distract us and vie for the throne of our hearts. But let's make Jesus the God above all gods in our lives. Thanks so much for coming to worship. Stick around for hospitality time. And as you go from this place, may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.